All right, Dr. S, what have we got today? So I want to talk today about Messier 14 or NGC 4602, which is a globular cluster. It's a pretty average globular cluster. It's about 100,000 stars or so, about 30,000 light years away. And it's actually a pretty good target for anybody who wants to see it in the night sky themselves. If you've got binoculars, it's supposedly very easy to find and it's in the constellation of Ophiuchus. So Ophiuchus is that 13th constellation in the zodiac and it was ignored by early astrologers because they didn't want 13 constellations in their zodiac because 13 was an unlucky number and it means that you know most people who think they're a Scorpius are actually an Ophiuchus. Not that it matters of course. What I want to talk about today in relation to Messier 14 is how you destroy a globular cluster. So it comes from understanding how they form, where they form, how they evolve and change, and then also how they die or how they are destroyed. And then the stars that are in those globular clusters are spread out amongst the Milky Way. So globular clusters are pretty old. They're what we call a simple stellar population in the fact that all of the stars we think have formed all at the same time, usually, from one big cloud of gas. And they've sort of been triggered to do that. It's not sort of normal star formation for a galaxy that's usually a bit more spread out. This has been caused either because, you know, like the gas has been shocked, so it's sort of been forced together by maybe a supernova explosion nearby or something that has made this huge, big, dense cloud of gas collapse down and form hundreds of thousands of stars rather than maybe the slower process it would have gone through in forming a, a couple of stars. So when we look at globular clusters, we then want to understand, well, when did they form? How old are they? And perhaps something we call the destruction timescale, which is quite a doomsday <laughs> thing to talk about. So once they have formed, there's a couple of things that can happen. You get star-star interactions in a globular cluster. So you have like flybys of stars basically, right? If you imagine that they're very, very dense, these globular clusters, there's all the stars are always going to encounter each other at some point. So what can happen is that you can have these gravitational slingshots. So you know when you sort of use the moon or Mars to give a gravitational slingshot to a satellite? Same thing can happen with two stars. So perhaps you have a, a massive star and a much less massive star. A less massive star can be slingshotted by the massive one. So they sort of exchange energy. And so what happens to the globular cluster is that over time, eventually the big ones sink to the center. And the little ones are either flung to the outskirts or in that slingshot, they're just thrown straight out of the cluster. The other thing that can happen is that you can have tidal interactions. So this is when you have the gravity on one side of the cluster is bigger than on the other side. So that can happen, say, if you encounter another globular cluster or if it encounters the center of the Milky Way, perhaps it gets a little bit too close to where there's lots of stars in the center. So if that happens with the gravity on one side stronger than on the other side, these globular clusters can be like pulled out into these streams of stars. And that's another way that you can sort of redistribute the stars all around. So those sort of two processes together are what we think can destroy globular clusters. So the question obviously is, how fast does that actually happen, that process? And that's obviously going to depend on how big is your cluster, how many stars you have in your cluster, how dense the cluster is, what path it is going to take through the galaxy during its lifetime. This is possible to model, but it's something called an n-body problem. So n is in like what number of objects are you trying to model in your computer at once? It actually scales as n squared. So a globular cluster with 100,000 stars is 10 billion times harder to model than the Earth's sun system alone. We have enough computing power as of 2010 to do this. Now the paper I've got today is from 1997. So it wasn't technically possible to do this back then, but they could be clever about it. They could make some simplifying assumptions. And what they would do is they'd split the globular cluster into a grid, right? And then each grid point they would treat individually, but that would probably contain, you know, a couple of hundred stars maybe, just to simplify things. So you're sort of taking an average. This is the one paper I could find that had Messier 14 in it. It's got a great name. Go on, show me. It's called the Destruction of the Galactic Globular Cluster System. Great title. Yeah, it's just like a dun 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 kind of a title, right? So what they've done in this is they've calculated that destruction time scale for lots of different globular clusters, including Messier 14. So Messier 14 is on the list as NGC 6402 down at the bottom there. And they calculate the destruction time scale as 30 billion years. So quite long, you know, the universe has only been around for 14 billion years, but this paper did it for all of the 119 globular clusters that they looked at. And they got a distribution of sort of the rates at which globular clusters could be destroyed. And I really dislike this figure because of the scale. <laughs> <laughs> because it's done in terms of something called the Hubble time, which is essentially, you know, how old is the universe? This is roughly what the Hubble time is. 
but they assume that was 10 billion years just to give it a nice round number. So instead of being in terms of billion years, it's in terms of 10 billion years. So one is 10 billion and 10 is 100 billion. 0.1 is actually a billion. So it's really confusing when you look at it. But if you actually find where 30 billion is for Messier 14, you'll find that it's basically right in the middle. So like I said at the beginning, it's a fairly average middle-aged cluster, right? But what that means is that half of the clusters in the Milky Way have a destruction time that is less than the current age of the universe. Now, obviously, they're still alive. <laughs> so they're obviously still alive. So it's not like they formed right at the beginning, we can assume, especially the ones that have destruction timescales of like, you know, hundreds of millions of years. So when we think about this, what we have to think about is, well, if this distribution that they found is the overarching grand design statistical distribution that any globular cluster that forms in the Milky Way, you could sample from this distribution and say, it'll either be hundreds of millions of years it'll be destroyed in or a hundred billion years that it'll be destroyed in, right? You'll have that spread. So half of the globular clusters that formed have already died. But then you've got things like Messier 14 that have got a, you know, destruction time scale of about 30 billion years. So if we're sort of thinking about the next 14 billion years of the universe's evolution, then about half the globular clusters that are already in the Milky Way, they are all going to be destroyed in the next sort of 14 billion years of the universe's history, probably. Which is kind of interesting, but also kind of like, no. Oh poor globular the clusters, <laughs> they just can't hold on long enough to sort of last it out. And we could end up with a galaxy that looks very different to what we see today um, with far less globular clusters, which are very useful tools for figuring out distances and ages. I reckon in 30 billion years, we will come up with some probably new tools. <laughs> we would hope, wouldn't we? <laughs> we would also have probably merged with Andromeda by then as well. So Andromeda will bring in its own population of globular clusters too. And also a lot of that, when I talked about tidal interaction before, where you, you sort of pull them out into streams, that's more likely to happen in a merger of two galaxies as well. So it's really interesting to think that perhaps that process of merging with Andromeda might actually speed up that process as well. What constitutes the destruction of the cluster? Does it have to be like, at what point do you say the cluster is destroyed? Yeah, when, it's, when the stars are no longer like gravitationally bound together. All the stars? I don't know actually, whether there's some sort of limit at which point you're like, oh, now that's just like six stars hanging around together in the universe. <laughs> like, do you no longer call it a cluster? But globular clusters are defined as being these incredibly dense areas of sky with, you know, hundreds of thousands of stars in them. So I think perhaps when you start to get to open cluster definition, we talked about open clusters on this channel before, right, that are much less dense, perhaps then you can say that globular cluster has been destroyed was a bit of a mystery. When you think about how we record where positions are on the sky, Messier had a very difficult job to do. There's no grid marking on the sky that he could reference again.